Neuroses is a mental condition that is often caused by past anxieties and past stresses. Now, I'm not a licensed therapist or a psychiatrist by any stretch of the imagination. But as most of you know, I am someone who is very, very fascinated by the mental complexities of the human mind. And in my opinion, neuroses is an extreme version of PTSD or CPTSD. A lot of times people with neuroses will show traits of borderline personality disorder and other sub disorders associated with BPD. And in my opinion, just my opinion, the subject of our Mystery Monday today suffered from an intense mental disorder. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a great big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this channel would absolutely not be possible. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today on Mystery Monday we're going to be talking about the saint, the mystic, and the stigmatic Gemma Galgani. Now, I am fully aware that this episode is probably going to trigger a lot of devout Catholics out there, especially people who practice the veneration of saints in the Catholic faith. And I would apologize for that, but I'm not really sorry because triggering somebody by giving your opinion is not actually your problem. Like, it's not my problem if you're triggered by my opinions on Gemma Galgani. And all I'll ask you guys is that you start to look at, and this is for me too, like I have to do this with people that I like as well, look at people with more objectivity instead of subjectivity. Now, with that being said, even though I personally believe that Gemma suffered from some major major mental disorder and psychological issues, possibly even schizophrenia, does not necessarily mean that Gemma was a bad person. Okay, I wanna make that very clear. And I feel like as we've talked about a lot in almost every episode, in our world today, people tend to be painting things either black or white. And very, very few things are black or white. Most human beings, most situations are shades of gray. Even in the law of one, if you're going to go forth density positive or towards the light, you guys know you've been on here for a while, you only have to be 51% service to others to go into the light. So again, if you if you're if you only have to be 51% service to others to go into light, that means that even in the, the path of light, there is accepted complexity and accepted shades of gray. I hope that makes sense. So when I, uh, in this episode, if I appear to be hard on Jimma Galgani, it's not necessarily her, that I'm being hard on. It's her mental disorder. Now, I do understand that at the time of her birth, especially if we're looking at the official narrative of history, perhaps there wasn't, well, I, I know there really wasn't, but that much understanding of mental sicknesses. You know, just because somebody has cancer or has diabetes, we don't value that person's worth on their sickness. We can see the two as separate things. The worth of somebody is the value of their heart and what their intention is. And with Gemma though, I mean, I can't, I, I wasn't around for Gemma, but I, I'm not here basically, I'm not here to, to judge her, her intentions. I'm not here to judge 
whether she was a good person or not. I'm just here looking at the mystery of her stigmata in what appears to be a very serious case of mental disorder, in my opinion, in my layman opinion. <laughs> I hope that may I hope I hope that's clear. All right. And and I'm not the only one that feels that way. In fact, during Gemma's time, there were many physicians that were very, very clear that what was happening to her was not what people thought was happening to her. Her family seems pretty interesting to me, too. Again, I don't want to speculate too much um, because of their her parents' jobs. I mean, a lot of people have jobs that are in these you know, establishment businesses um, that are bad, but the person's good. But, you know, I, I still, with that being said, I still find it very interesting what her dad's job is. So what we're going to do in this episode is that we're actually just going to go through the timeline of Gemma's life. And then we're going to actually look at Gemma's biography on her own website or the website that's dedicated to her and talk about some of these issues in her life in a more objective way from the eyes of 2024 when we understand the way trauma plays out in a different way than perhaps they did in the late 19th century. Now, Gemma has been sainted. Um, I don't know if I've said this before, but I guess it goes without say. I'm not a huge fan of the whole sainting process. You know, I'll talk about saints like St. Saint Francis or St. Padre Pio because they have been venerated by the church just because i don't agree with the sainting process does not mean that the sainting process doesn't exist like i hate when people do that like if they don't like something they just like pretend like it doesn't exist or they refuse to even acknowledge it no i'm acknowledging that these people have been sainted or venerated by the catholic church however my own personal opinion on sainting is it's bullshit I don't think any human being should be granted that title. Um, putting people with that title is definitely on the negative path, the path of darkness, uh, the negative in the polarity has a pecking order like with negative polarity there's elitism there's a pecking order in the value of human beings and i choose to 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 be on the side of light when it comes to this and recognize that all of us are complex and none of us are better or more worthy than anybody else with that being said some of us specialize in certain talents and gifts to help people like i specialize in yoga i'm authorized to help other people that's i do have authority in the mysore room however that does not mean that i am more valuable of a human being than my students whereas when we're sainting people we're literally saying that they're more valuable in god's eyes and that is complete bunk to me but playing a, a devil's advocate to that with a lot of these saints actually all of the saints none of them were sainted when they were alive so we don't know like how these people would have reacted in being sainted like i i would assume especially in the case of like saint francis i would assume that that's not something he would actually want for himself and let me tell you if i were to be sainted after my death i would haunt the shit out of whoever <laughs> whoever sainted me like don't do that do not do that that is not cool like i'm not i'm not some spirit that was a human that can be prostituted out to the masses to call on me in the afterlife to intervene for them for god like don't do that human beings like catholics listen to me this is what i really want you to listen to me with this anybody any religion you don't need you don't need a priest a teacher a mentor or a saint to talk to god don't do that you can go to a mentor or a priest well saints are dead for advice and for help to talk through situations with but they're not the spokesperson for god the pope is not the spokesperson for god in on the side of light there is no pecking order on the side of light the pope and the peasant are of equal value to god the peasant has just as much authority to talk to god as the pope does okay nowhere in the bible even in the canonized 
messed up Bible, the edited Bible, nor in the missing books of the Bible, does it say that there are certain people that are more valuable than other people. The real Yahshua, the real one, never said that. And if anybody takes anything away from this stigmatic series, I hope that's what you, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I see people who think so low of themselves that they literally think that there's another living, breathing human being that somehow has more authority over them in the eyes of God. Do not let somebody use God as a weapon against you. Now, in the case of like Padre Pio, as we spoke about, when he talked about confessions being important, as I said, it sounds like what he was talking about in that situation was therapy. Talking about the things that bother you, the things you feel guilty about, that's basically therapy. But nowhere did he actually say that he had more authority than anybody else, right? So I just want to get this like across you guys. If you need to go to confession to get shit off your chest and to feel better and to talk through things with people, awesome. That helps your mental health. But understand this, that priest has no, there's nothing about that priest that is more valuable in the eyes of God than you. Please know that. Nobody else has any say over your life path, your agreement with God over the experiences you would have now than you. You're it, boo. Again, go to a therapist, go to a mentor, go to a teacher or a priest for conversation to help you kind of figure your own thoughts out for sure. A good therapist, a good teacher, a good priest is not even going to tell you what to do. They're just going to talk it through with you and help you come to the conclusion that you need to come from. Like my teacher in India, if I were to go talk to my teacher in India about an issue that I'm having in my life and I don't know what to do with this issue, my teacher, he talks in metaphors. He doesn't tell me what to do. He doesn't tell anybody. In fact, I've seen so many of my friends come out of like meetings with our teacher in India and being like, he just talked to me in metaphors, like didn't tell me what to do. I was hoping somebody would tell me what to do and he wouldn't tell me what to do. He just talked to me in metaphors, discussed it with me, helped me kind of get my thoughts in order so that I can make those decisions. That's a good teacher. That's a good priest. That's a good mentor, a person that's not going to tell you what to do with your life, but maybe help you talk things through. Again, I'm digressing, but in studying Gemma's story, I just feel like it's really important that we examine that. Because Gemma herself is going to rely on like saints to intervene for her. No, boo. No. You have to intervene for yourself. Okay? And so if you are somebody who feels like for some whacked out reason that a priest or a rabbi or whatever, that there's somebody in your life that has more of a connection to God than you do, then I beg you. Please love yourself more. Please respect yourself more than that. And if, if you're having a hard time with that, then find a therapist, find a teacher, find somebody who's going to help you heal whatever it is you need to heal so you understand how effing beautiful and magical and special you are. You do not bow to any human being. You hold your head up high. You do not cower to another human being, especially one that's using God against you. Okay? God help Pope Francis if I ever met him. I wouldn't treat him any different. Actually, maybe I would treat him a little bit different because we know some of the shenanigans that Pope Francis has been involved in. So I probably would look at him at a little more disgust than I would other human beings. But there's no way in hell I'm going to kiss his ring. There's no way in hell I'm going to kiss his feet. No. No. I don't kiss any man's feet. I was about to say, maybe, no, just kidding. I was going to make a joke about that. No, I, I don't do that. And I don't expect anybody out there, as me as a teacher, I don't expect any of my students out there to kiss my feet. I'm your teacher. That's all I am. I'm helping you learn how to do something. A teacher's job is to eventually teach themselves out of a job. That's it. I'm just a human being like you are, trying to figure it out too. Okay, with that being said, 
sorry it just it you guys like it upsets me so much like it upsets me so much when i listen to podcasts when i'm studying these things or hear stories or hear these things about people for some reason thinking that they don't have a communication aligned to god like i just like that breaks my heart like I want to shake these people and be like, do you not see how beautiful you are? Do you not see how special you are? How clever you are? God doesn't make junk. You're not junk. You're worthy. You're equally worthy. Everybody on this planet is equally worthy of God. All right. Now, sorry. Let's get into it. Because what I'm giving you, what we're about to go through is go through Gemma Galgani's timeline of her life. And then we're going to talk about her, what I perceive to be as mental disorders. All right. So let's get into it, guys. Gemma Galgani was a contemporary of Padre Pio, which is who we talked about last week. In my opinion, again, this is another reason why we're going through a few of these stigmatics, because I think every single story is going to be different. Every human being, being is going to have a different story to tell with their experiences. I think Padre Pio was probably a very good person who had very good intentions. He might have suffered from scrupulosity, but beyond that, I think he really had really good intentions. But I'm I'm not so sure about Gemma Galgani. She could have had good intentions, but I really do believe she was suffering from a major, major mental disorder. All right. So Gemma Galgani was born about 11 years before Padre Pio. She was born on the 12th of March, 1878. So she was a Pisces. Now, this is what's interesting. Gemma Galgotti was born to a relatively wealthy family, whereas Padre Pio was born to a poor family. She was born to a relatively wealthy family. Her father, Enrico Galgani, which is Henry in English, some websites we're going to look like look at actually call him Henry. He was a schmarmacist. I can't say the word these things, but back in like the 19th century, so he was a schmarmacist. Interestingly enough, she ends up being like the saint of schmarmacy. Do with that as you will. Okay, so she was she had a big family. Some uh, some sites say that she was the fifth of eight children. Some say she was the fourth of eight children. She was, however, the first daughter born to Enrique and his wife. Now, Gemma's mother developed tuberculosis when she was two and a half years old, which I think is super interesting, especially since her father is a schmarmacist. There is a joke that says the doctor's children are always the sickest. Like, I come from a family of doctors, and we were always sick growing up. So there's, there's this kind of this joke around that. So it's interesting that her mother, as well as a few of her siblings, are going to, like so many people in this time in history, are going to be unalived by tuberculosis. We also know that Gemma was very, very close to her mother, as a lot of daughters are at a very young age. And so I can't help but think that her mother's unaliving played a huge impact into Gemma's psyche. With that being said, a lot of kids lose their parents at very young ages, but they don't end up developing the mental disorders and the hysteria that Gemma ends up developing. And so I do think there's absolutely more to the story of Gemma's trauma as a child. So Gemma's mother left this earth on the 17th of September, 1885, when Gemma herself was seven years old. Gemma's older brother, Carlo, would go, would also leave the earth around this time, as well as her youngest sister. Gemma was also very, very close to one of her brothers named Gino. And at this time of their mother's passing, Gino himself would also, while studying to be a priest, would also develop tuberculosis and he himself would exit the earth. So no doubt, by the time Gemma was seven years old, she had lost a lot of her family members. That's her mother, two brothers, one of whom she was very, very, very close to, and one of her sisters. Again, that is extreme abandonment issues that we're looking at, extreme anger, probably some rage issues that we're looking at. But with that being said, she's not the only person in the course of 
history who has had this unfortunate thing happen to her as a child. So just because these things happened to her and they was they were horrific, I, I mean, again, like other people didn't go on to be hysteronics and have mental disorders. So I do think there's also more underneath the surface that was going on to put Gemma in the state that she was in. Now, Gemma's father, and again, we do also culturally have to look, this is the end of the 19th century. This is not modern times. Even though it's considered modern history, it's not the Borgia, the Borgia family from like the 1400s is also considered to be modern history. It's just a category, you guys. It's not ancient history, right? So even though it's modern history, it's still not modern times to us. And the 19th century was still very, very different from how we're living in the 21st century. So now I would assume that if a little seven-year-old girl lost her mother, the father would probably do everything he could to get that little girl into therapy, to love on his daughter, to help in any way he can to help her transition to losing her mom as helpfully as possible. But that's not what Enrico did. And again, I can't really blame him for this because this was the end of the 19th century. Because the mother was no longer around, Enrico decided to send his daughter Gemma to basically board at a nursery school run by a husband and wife. So even though it's like a nursery school, like a boarding school, when I was reading about this situation, I kept just getting this this thought in my head, foster care. That's just kind of what came into my head. And granted, there could be nothing to it. This the this husband and wife that took in Gemma and like taught her and kind of raised her in replace of her mother and her father basically could have been amazing to her. They could have been an incredible influence on her. But still to me, something's weird about this. Something sketchy, sketchy about this. But nonetheless, Gemma is at seven years old, sent to like this nursery school because her mother has passed away. I'm sure her father didn't even think to check on her to see if she was emotionally okay since losing her mom and three of her siblings, but nonetheless, here we are, she's at this nursery school. By the age of 16, Gemma develops spinal meningitis, and God bless her, I am shocked she survived this. Spinal meningitis is, even today, is pretty deadly. There's not... You have a better chance today if you develop spinal meningitis of surviving than you would in the late 19th century but nonetheless even today it's you're hospitalized like you're in icu like this is a very very scary sickness to develop it has to do with like bacteria and the spinal cord and the spinal fluid i was tested for a spinal meningitis when i was um around Gemma's age actually when i got really sick through a spinal tap thank god i didn't have it like it's a very serious i think my parents i, I remember my parents even saying at that time because i'd also been tested for like leukemia as well that my parents would have rather me had leukemia than spinal meningitis and i actually get that because leukemia for kids is pretty treatable but that's how scary spinal meningitis is so the fact that she survived this at 16 in the late 19th century century excuse me is pretty phenomenal and she she gave gratitude for her survival to the sacred heart of jesus christ now i kind of spoken about this briefly and for the protestants in the room like we don't have this we don't have this in the protestant church not saying that protestantism is any better or any less corrupt than the catholic church of course not but the sacred heart of Jesus Christ. You know, see those those, those um, candles you'll see like in Target or some stores where Jesus is like opening his chest and there's a heart there. Well, back about four years ago when I started researching into some other stories, I ran across this um, claim that the practice of the sacred heart of Jesus Christ is is tied to cannibalism, which wouldn't surprise me. I don't know that for certain. And if you guys want, I can try to do some deeper diving into that um, subject. But as a pro maybe this is my Protestantism showing how I was raised Presbyterian. I'm not, I don't go to church anymore. But 
why can't you just pray to Jesus? Like, why does it have to be to his, like the sacred heart? I don't understand this. Like this, if it's not about cannibalism, then what the hell is it about? We know in a lot of these like satanic rituals, they actually eat the heart of their victim. So anyway, side note, but that's who she prayed to. And she believes that there were two saints that intervened on her behalf, Gabriel and a woman named Marguerite Maria. And again, like, don't be asking dead people to intervene for you. Like, gross. Like, just talk to God yourself. So I do think her surviving was pretty miraculous. But I don't think who she credited with her survival is who actually helped her survive. Just my opinion. But I know that Gemma was raised extremely Catholic. So at 16, this is what she's conditioned to believe anyway. So that's not saying that she herself is like some psychopath that is participating in nefarious stuff this is basically what she was taught to believe this is just my observation of these religious practices when Gemma was 19 years old her father passed away Enrique left and so Gemma being the oldest female sibling not the oldest sibling but the oldest female sibling was then responsible for basically being the parental type for her younger siblings around this time at 19 she had two marriage proposals which she turned down which if she didn't want to get married that's her prerogative but part of me thinks like she turned them down because she had at this point been kind of conditioned to believe that true love comes from suffering which we're going to get to when we look at her website because i have a lot to say about that and so i have to kind of wonder and speculate did she want to get married but she turned these proposals down because she felt like in her programmed mind that in order to be a devout sister to these siblings and to show her siblings that she loved them and be a good daughter to her deceased parents that she had to like put her own happiness on the back burner like i just i have so many questions about this decision that she made again it could have been that maybe she was a lesbian i don't know it could have been that she didn't like these men she didn't want these men fair enough girl if you don't want to marry these guys or if you weren't interested in men sexually then fair play to you absolutely you do you boo but i can't help but wonder if reading listening to all these podcasts about you and reading all these blogs about you and about your personality and your perceptions of love i can't help but wonder if you misunderstand or misunderstood because you're no longer living what real love meant we're going to get to that later, though. But nonetheless, at 19, she's turned down marriage proposals. She is now mama to her younger siblings. She's 19. Her frontal lobe hasn't even developed yet. She has to take, she comes from this, like, upper middle class family. And now she's got to, like, take these, these jobs, like, janitorial jobs, just to support her siblings. And trust me, I know that there are a lot of siblings out there who at a very young age had to take guardianship of their younger siblings. I'm not, I'm not negating that. Like that is some serious stress. And I'm sure that that did add to a person who probably already had complex post-traumatic stress disorder, probably already had a lot of trauma on top of it. And then you put that adult responsibility with it we're looking at a recipe for disasters and and i do like i totally respect her from taking guardianship of her kid or her children i told our siblings i totally respect her for that and if you are somebody who took guardianship of your younger siblings at a very young age my hat is off to you for doing that and i would love to hear looking back on that situation like if you were not, if you were under the age of 25 and you had to take guardianship of a younger sibling i would love to hear from you like in the comment section like let me know what that was like give us an honest um portrayal of what your life was like like the stress you were under you know do you feel like you missed out on some of your experiences as a young adult because you had to play mama or daddy to your younger siblings i know you would uh, listen i would have done it like if something had happened to my parents before my sister turned 18 i absolutely would have taken guardianship of her hands down like no problem but that's not saying like two things can be true, right? Like you absolutely will do that for your family, but it can still cause you harm.
right? Two things can be true here. So I would love to hear from you if you are somebody who had to do that. But nonetheless, at 19, she's now got full guardianship of her younger siblings because her parents have passed away. Gemma first received the stigmata when she was 21 years old. This was the 8th of June, 1899. And in a lot of these stigmatic cases, we have doctors who are literally like, no, this shit's real. Like doctors who are like, uh, we can't explain where these wounds are coming from with these people. But with Gemma's story, we have a lot of doctors who examined her who absolutely said she was faking this. We have people claiming her old guardians when she was at the nursery boarding school, claiming that she was she would prick herself with needles a lot. And if anybody has studied borderline personality disorder i've talked about it a lot i study mental disorders because i find them fascinating as you guys probably have guessed when people self-harm like i can't say it but you know self-harm with that's a part of borderline personality disorder is self-harming in that way right now other forms of self-harm like eating disorders not necessarily associated with bpd it can be but not necessarily but this nine times out of ten if you know what i'm saying where blood is drawn nine times out of ten is part of bpd borderline personality disorder which is what one of her doctors is actually going to diagnose her with which we'll talk about later on this episode um they didn't call it that back then so to me this is very suspicious because even with a lot of the other stigmatics even though they had people who doubted them Every doctor who examined them all said they didn't know where these injuries were coming from. But again, with Gemma, most doctors are like, she's doing this to herself. We see the needles. This is, this is not what you think it is. But nonetheless, around this time, when Gemma starts to show signs of sti the stigmata, whether, true or whether she's doing it to herself or not, she's also starting to become somewhat psychic, where she's predicting future events. Now, we'll get into that a little bit later, too, because a lot of people with schizophrenia do this as well, and they'll claim to pre uh, predict future events that never happen. It, it's just very, we're in shades of gray here, right? She also was um, said to levitate. Now, I, I absolutely do believe that most mental disorders are caused by influences of dark entities i'm not saying that like i'm not super fundamentalist or religious by any stretch of the imagination but i do believe everything's like a spiritual war and so even if you can have a mental disease and we can see it with chemical reactions in the brain i do think that's brought on by darker oppression like oppression from dark entities that's able to oppress you because of past trauma that wasn't healed even with myself like even with situations with myself too so with levitation, we know that levitation can be used, like all of these like spiritual mystical gifts can be given from uh, shades of, of dark or light. You know, like people can levitate because they've learned to control their consciousness through their own self-healing. They can also levitate because they're in communion with dark entities. And I do think Gemma was in communion with dark entities. She would claim to see beings a lot like the Mother Mary. I'm very skeptical at this point, especially after studying the Law of One. I think almost like nine times out of 10 people who are seeing entities, nine times out of 10, I believe that these entities are of the dark, pretending to be of the light. The Law of One talks about this a lot simply because beings of the light will not interfere with your free will. So beings of the light that are here to guide you and protect you, it's usually more subtle, right? It's usually more subtle. They usually don't appear. But we know, like, according to the Cassiopeians, we know that even all the dudes in the Bible, like Moses, the burning bush, was a 4D entity, negative being, a, a, Lizzie, a lizard. We know that with Abraham, he was communing with negative beings. So this can trick a lot of people. Right, into thinking if, if you see an entity that you think is the Mother Mary or you think is a divine being and they're of the light, it can trick you and manipulate you into thinking it's something good when in actuality it's trying to use you as a tool for evil. And that is exactly what I think was happening with Gemma, in my own personal opinion. You're allowed to have your opinions, but in my own personal opinion. Gemma is definitely causing quite a stir amongst the Catholics because 
people you know that she's kind of a freak right and i hate to say it that way but she's levitating she's bleeding she's predicting future events she's claiming that she can talk to these uh, spiritual beings that are venerated in the catholic church like for some reason she's the special one that that gets to like talk to these beings and so people are viewing her a little bit differently i do think as a historonic in my opinion she had histor she was a historonic her borderline personality disorder was that of a histronic i think this was a cry for attention but nonetheless my opinion in 1903 she develops tuberculosis and she ends up passing away of tuberculosis on the 11th of april 1903 she was canonized as a saint on the 2nd of may 1904 and in 1985 y'all her heart <laughs> Her little literal heart, just like Padre Pio's heart, was placed in a church named after her in Madrid, Spain. Now, even though there were a lot of doctors and people that she knew that basically were saying the girl's lying, like many people in her life are like, she's causing her own stigmatic, she's doing it with sewing needles. And even though there were a lot of doctors that felt like there was something going on with her that was not what she thought it was. There was one doctor in particular that I am interested in. And, and this was Dr. Pietro Fanner. Dr. Pietro Fanner diagnosed her with neurosis and hysterical behavior. In my opinion, this was like the precursor as a layperson from what I could see to what would become known today as borderline personality disorder hysteronic now again if you are a person who practices in the medical field i don't know if you can comment because i know people with i've learned that it's easier for me as a lay person who isn't a licensed therapist to speculate it's if you're a doctor it's harder to speculate legally so if you can if you can comment though if you're able to comment on this i would love to hear from you in the comment section but i totally understand for a therapist if they can't comment on this even though this person is long gone but i kind of wanted to look guys at the definition of hysteronic so i've had my fair share um run-in with hysteronics before hysteronics basically they're kind of the people that like they're extroverted but not like an extra you know there's people who are extroverted who are normal healthy people who are just extroverted but hysteronics will go like they will go like extremes like they'll dye their hair crazy colors and they'll you know go and get random tattoos without thinking about it and they'll just do crazy crazy things especially with sexuality which we don't really see that with Gemma. but that's not to say she wasn't in a hysteronic we'll also have to look at like the time period she lived in as well so let's look at, let's just look at this so hysteronic personality disorder hysteronic personality disorder hpd is a mental condition marked by unstable emotion a distorted self-image and an overwhelming desire to be noticed People with HPD often behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention. Overview. What is historic hysteronic personality disorder? Hysteronic personality disorder is a mental health condition marked by intense, unstable emotion and a distorted self-image. The word hysteronic means dramatic or theatrical. So again, let me remind you that Dr. Pietro Fanner said that Gemma was suffered from neuroses, which is a uh, which is an extreme anxiety disorder with hysterical behavior. So hysterical, hysteronic, same word means dramatic or theatrical. So whereas we had Padre Pio who tried to hide, who was very introverted, we have Gemma Galgani, who very much according to a doctor who worked with her, I mean, she's dead now. So we don't, this word, we're taking this doctor's word for it. She was very theatrical. She wanted to be noticed. Basically, he's saying she has extreme anxiety, extreme, extreme neuroses, and she's acting out for attention. For people with hysteronic personality disorder, their self-esteem depends on the approval of others and doesn't come from a true feeling of self-worth. They have an overwhelming desire to be noticed and often behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention. People with hysteronic personality disorder often don't realize their behavior and way of thinking may be problematic. 
Histrionic personality disorder is one of the group of condition called cluster B personality disorder, which involves dramatic and erratic behavior. Who does histrionic personality disorder affect? Histrionic personality disorder usually begins in your teens or early 20s. Women and, pe women and people assigned female at birth are more commonly diagnosed with histrionic personality disorder than men and people dis assigned male at birth. But researchers think that men and people signed male whatever may be underdiagnosed and i have seen dr john talk about this as well from a hidden true crime it has even borderline personality disorder is mo more in hysteronic is more commonly found in females however i have heard dr john read some medical stuff basically saying that it does affect men it just plays itself out differently in males and it does in females so that's interesting that they're saying that because that is a new science that's kind of being shown that hysteronic or bpd or hpd is going to also affect men but play out differently anyway how common is, is hysteronic personality disorder hysteronic personality disorder is relatively rare Res research estimates that about one percent of people have this condition symptoms and causes what are the signs and symptoms of hysteronic personality disorder the main feature of hysteronic personality disorder is displaying excessive superficial emotional emotionality or sexuality to draw attention to themselves a person with histrionic personality disorder may feel underappreciated or depressed when they're not the center of attention have rapidly shifting and shallow emotions be dramatic and extremely emotionally expressive even to the point of embarrassing friends and family in public have a larger than life presence be persistently charming and flirtatious be overly concerned with their physical appearance, use their physical appearance to draw attention to themselves by wearing bright colored or revealing clothes. As I said, like the, the, the dyeing of the hair, if you dye your hair different colors, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have hysteronic personality disorder, but that is a, a sign that someone might have it and act and act inappropriately, inappropriately sexually with most of the people they meet, even when they're not sexually attracted to them speak dramatically and express strong opinions with few facts or details to support their opinions be gullible and evilly influenced by others especially by people they admire think that their relationships with others are closer than they usually are have difficulty maintaining relationships often seeking fake often seeming fake or shallow in their interactions with others need instant gratification and become bored or frustrated very easily constantly seek reassurance or approval what causes hysteronic personality disorder personality disorders including hysteronic personality disorder are among the least understood mental health conditions studies have been done about hysteronic and other personality disorders have identified several factors that may lead to the development of hysteronic or other personality disorders genetic hysteronic personalities disorders tend to run in families so scientists think there may be a genetic inherited link childhood trauma Ch children may cope with trauma such as child abuse or the death of a family member that later as an adult may be disruptive or problematic in their life and become part of the personality disorder parenting styles children who are experiencing parenting styles that lack boundaries are overindulgent or inconsistent may be more likely to develop hysteronic personality disorder in addition parents who display dramatic erratic volatile or inappropriate i'm not going to say that word again behavior put their children at risk for developing this condition some researchers think that problems in parent-child relationships lead to the characteristic low self-esteem in people in hpd all right you guys so that's his hysteronic personality disorder which to me sounds like what dr pietro fanner is what that sounds like that's what he diagnosed Jimma Galgani with but in the words of the 19th century so she's suffering from extreme neuroses with a hysteronic behavior so before we get back to the very very interesting story of Jimma Galgani I just want to go ahead and tell you guys about a few of our sponsors here on Esoteric Atlanta as most of you know I film these episodes out of my bedroom i'm literally in the corner of my bedroom right now and all of the research that's done for this channel is done by myself and only myself there is no production team around here it is literally just me i film 
I research, I edit, I do it all. So with that being said, I am definitely self-employed. And I could not keep this channel running if it wasn't for, of course, my patrons and my producers, but also our sponsors. And I wanted to briefly talk about three of our sponsors today here on Esoteric Atlanta before we get back to the story. We have Spooky2 and Mira Mate. These are two sister companies owned by the same company. As you guys know, if we look at the website quickly, if you are interested in taking back your health, and if you are super interested in things like Tesla technology and vibrational healing, then you're going to love the company Miramate and Spooky too. So this is Miramate's website. And Miramate is like a mat that their main product is. Here's the big mat that, that it brings out vibration and electric energy that you can lay on and sleep on to help rebalance your body. You also have a smaller mat you can sit on, plus other devices like this one you can wear on a hike if you have knee issues or something going on to help stabilize your body in the hike. They also have the Miramate Ray, G-U-N, can't say that word on YouTube. That's a UVA light therapy for skin issues. Now with Miramate as well as Spooky 2, you get 5% off of your purchases. Let's go ahead and just quickly look at Spooky 2. Um, I've been with Spooky 2 a lot longer than Miramate, so some of you guys are super familiar with Spooky 2. But Spooky 2 is a rife machine. So both Miramate and Spooky 2, again, work off of this idea of Tesla technology and using electro energy, vibrational energy to heal the body and issues in the body. So with these Rife machines, the Rife machines are definitely more intricate than the mat. Um, they have different packages you can use, you can get. As you know, Shanti over in Aquarius Rising Africa, she also promotes Sp Spooky too. We have so many incredible, incredible testimonies of people who really healed themselves using Spooky too. Now, don't be super, super intimidated if you're interested in getting this in the technology behind this, even though it looks super complicated. As you guys know, the company Spooky too, as well, as Miramate are super, super, super good at customer service. And so they will walk you through how to set everything up, especially Brad. So Bradley Johnson, he comes on my channel every now and again. I freaking love Brad. He is, I, I, he's like a Tesla nerd and I freaking love it because he is literally using his smarts to help everybody figure out how to work this technology for themselves. So if you do want to get spooky too but you're super intimidated by the process of setting it up or learning how to use it because it's kind of complex don't worry don't don't you dare worry about that one bit because you have people like brad that are going to be able to help you set it up see like you can even register with on the website to have that he'll come and help you right like figure out how to work this awesome machine now the final sponsor i quickly want to talk about of course is gnostic tv as most of you guys know i am a content creator for gnostic tv if you're new to this channel and you like the work that i do here on esoteric atlanta you can also check out gnostic tv gnostic tv is like a netflix for those who are spiritually curious are curious about the truth in the world a lot of people who are content creators on gnostic tv like myself have suffered heavily with things like shadow banning and censorship some people have had their whole platforms taken down and so we have found a home on gnostic gnostic does have a paywall but that is that basically helps support us it's super cheap it helps support us in our work and i tend to put stuff there that i cannot put on YouTube. So there are different stories on YouTube and Gnostic. Now, with that being said, Shanti, my friend Shanti over on Aquarius Rising Africa and I with Jay from Gnostic TV are putting together a panel of people who have survived the um, controllers, the establishment, the Aluma Shmati, we'll say, um, the Yahtzees, you know, th those people that they've survived, they were born into these families that had these weird, we'll say, religious practices, and they've survived, and they're whistleblowers. And we put together a panel of all these survivors to talk to you guys about their stories, tell you things to look out for when it comes to this dark cult that's kind of ruling our world, um, and so forth. We've also got people on this panel who are heavy researchers, like my friend Rocker Mike, who also has a series on Gnostic TV. He and his partner, Rob Rossi, definitely look at like true crime and try to see the story that we weren't told. 
more specifically in things like the Son of Sam case, where there obviously was a lot of occultism involved in the Son of Sam case. And so I hope you guys, if you're interested in getting tickets to this online panel event, there is a link down in the description box below. It does not matter what country you're in because, again, this is online. All right, you guys. With that being said, 5% off any purchase you make from Spooky 2 are mirror made by using my name, Bryce Watson, a discount. And tickets to the events on Gnostic TV, three of our great sponsors here on Esoteric Atlanta. With that being said, let's get back to the show. All right, you guys, let's look at St. Gemma Galgani's website so we get a more in-depth look at her story together. Once again, just to reiterate, these are all my opinions. It is my opinion that she had a mental disorder. It is my opinion that there was some probably underlying underlying trauma that caused her to act this way. I also think that she, like many women, is very confused or was very confused about what true love looks like. You are all very much entitled to your own opinions and you are absolutely welcome to share your opinions. But like most things, please be respectful to each other in the comment section below. I want to also reiterate that just by believing a saint like Jim and Galgani might not have been what they portray her to be does not mean that she was necessarily a nefarious person. If Gemma Galgani did have a personality disorder like borderline personality disorder or hysteronic personality disorder, um, that doesn't mean that she was a bad person either. You know, if someone has cancer, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. So it just means she just uh, she had a mental disorder that was left unchecked in her life. All right. So let's look. I will place this website down in the description box as well so you can look at it for yourself. So the biographical sketch of St. Gemma Gal Gani. St. Gemma was a lay person whose life was marked throughout by divine favors and extraordinary graces and also great trials and suffering. Um, I don't think that the side of light gives divine favors to some people and not to others. I just want to make that very clear. I also think a lot of her sufferings here was her misconfu uh, confusing or misunderstanding what love actually looks like. And I don't mean just like romantic love. I mean love in general. So I was having this conversation actually last Sunday with a few of my students about this. Um, we were talking about, especially with girls, we were talking actually about romantic love in that situation. And I had said that I had shared on my Instagram a um, video of a woman talking about how she blames basically her misunderstanding of love for going all the way back to like kindergarten. Like when a boy, when you're little, you're a little girl and a boy would be like, be mean to you on the playground or like throw rocks at you or something. People would always tell you, well, that's because he likes you. And that could very well be the case for that age group. But what people neglect to do is to remind women as they grow, grow older, that when a man is mean to you, that's not love. That's not love. And I was saying how I think sometimes like women confuse passion for toxicity. So like if you're fighting with your boyfriend all the time and making up with him, that's actually toxic. That's not healthy. And I was saying that after I went through my own trauma therapy, um, I realized and started after I went through trauma therapy and I started dating again and I started dating healthier men. I realized that like the best relationship is the meh relationships. Like my boyfriend and I don't really fight that much at all. If we do, it's over stupid stuff. Right. And it's squashed pretty, pretty quickly. And I know like he's not going to cheat on me. Like I'm not sitting at home at night stressed about where he is or checking his phone. Right. Because it's a healthy relationship. With that being said, there's not a whole lot of like, again, we're not, I'm not screaming or, you know, it's, it's anyway, I hope you guys get what I'm saying. And I think sometimes again, we are taught as women that in order to be loving towards our families or our partners that we have to put their needs first all the time. And we have to be in a place of suffering in order to like prove our love. And I'm not saying like, and again, not even in just romantic relationships, even in relationships with like your children or your friends, 
yes, in, in a relationship where there is a love involved, whether it's romantic or friendship, obviously there are different kinds of love. There has to be compromise, right? Like my boyfriend loves sci-fi movies. Oddly enough, I don't like sci-fi movies. Not a fan. They bore the crap out of me. But sometimes I will compromise and we'll watch a sci-fi movie at night. I don't particularly like them. We don't do it all the time. Now, if I were under the illusions of suffering, meaning love, then I would every single night like bow to his needs and submit to his needs. But no, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I think too, we think that if, if we're suffering, then we're proving a point maybe to ourselves or others. And, you know, in spirituality, there is a certain allotment of suffering, but the only reason why suffering exists in spirituality is so that you will actually change right? Like if you're suffering and uncomfortable, you'll move and you'll change and you'll do something. It's not meant to be there permanently. Okay. And I actually would love, uh, maybe we can do this as a round table with a bunch of women, maybe with Shanti or Catherine or something and talk more about this. If you guys want more of a deeper conversation about all of our misunderstandings about love and what love really looks like and what a healthy relationship really looks like ladies especially the young ladies in the room if you're listening to me as someone who has been in abusive relationships before and now is in a healthy relationship when a man loves you he is not going to hurt you intentionally he's not going to manipulate you when your friends love you they're not going to manipulate you they're not going to want you to suffer so anyway uh, that's We'll, ex we'll expand upon that in a separate video if that's something you guys want. So let's read that again. St. Gemma was a lay person whose life was marked throughout by divine favors and extraordinary graces she, and also great trials and suffering. Though she was an extraordinary mystic and stigmatic, bearing in her body the marks of the Lord Jesus, her spiritual life was quite hidden from the world. She was never the object of public curiosity or veneration. From outward appearances, her life seemed ordinary, but her soul lived in the heights. She was especially chosen by God to be a soul victim. Y'all, God doesn't do this. I, I want us to be very clear about this. God, the real creator, does not do this shit. Lucifer does. You're getting my like genuine reaction. I've only skimmed this. So there are some things I didn't notice when I first, and I apologize, guys. I, my nose is crazy today. I don't know if it's like the smog, but I apologize. She was especially chosen by God to be a soul victim. That is, she was especially called to sacrifice and suffer <gasps> for the conversion of sin. Y'all. Y'all. <gasps> no. No, stop, emergency. Oh, in other words, she was a victim of divine love. Hers was a life of sacrifice and suffering for the conversions of sinners in reparation for sin. No, nobody else can do that for you. Suffering for another person does not help the other person. It's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. But in reverse, like, you are not a victim of divine love. Divine love has no victims. That's what I'm saying, you guys. Holy shit. No, this is so unhealthy, guys. That is not true. What you just read there, please don't. It's shit like this that manipulates people. No, God does not. No, you cannot pay for the sins of somebody else. Even attempting to try to do that is only going to create more karma for you and more karma for the other person. You cannot interrupt somebody else's karma. And there is no suffering with divine love. We go into suffering because we're out of alignment with divine love. We're in our ego. And that suffering has to make us so uncomfortable that we start to move and shift out of it. So this... This whole paragraph right here, you guys, 
that is a very dangerous paragraph. I am appalled by this. This is promoting things like abusive relationships. This is promoting things like spiritual manipulation. No. <sighs> appalled. I might actually email this company and be like, what? or whoever is running this freaking website and be like, what the hell are you actually doing? Because what you're talking about is Lucifer, not God. Gemma was born at Camigliano, Italy on March 12th, 1878. She was the fourth of eight children and the eldest daughter of Henry and Ariuela Galgani. Her father was a very succe successful schmarmischist. A month after her birth, the family moved to Lucca, where she remained for the rest of her life. Sacrifice and suffering began at a very young age. Childhood trauma. Remember, this is part of histrionic personality disorder is intense childhood trauma. Like all children, Gemma loved her mother with all her heart. Her mother was a holy and devout Catholic. And Gemma's first lessons in Christian, Christian piety were received on her mother's knees. And it was by her mother's side in their parish church that she first learned to taste the hidden and unutterable sweetness of mass. It was mama, she said years after, who as a child made me desire to go to heaven. Death of her mother. It was during these tender years that her mother fell victim to tuberculosis. Her long lingering illness endured with saintly resignation was made more difficult by the thought that she must soon leave her children when they most needed her care. I don't doubt that. Like, I can't imagine what it must be like for a mother to know she's not going to live long to protect her children. Gemma came to know that her mother was going to go to heaven, of which she had so often heard her speak, but her great wish to, was to go with her. That is a huge sign. Like, in 2024, if that was happening, like, if a mother is dying of a disease and a, a child wants to go with her, a young child... I would get that child in therapy ASAP. Every day she had returned from school, her first thought was to hurry to her mother's sick room, fearing that her mother might have taken flight in her absence. Again, this is so much childhood trauma, you guys. It's it's no wonder that she was probably, in my opinion, a hysteric, uh, hysteronic. Meanwhile, the day of her confirmation came, May 26, 1885. And with this, the first of those holy communi communications would play such a large part in her spiritual life. During the Mass of Thanksgiving after the ceremony, all of a sudden, she tells us, a voice in my heart said, will you give me your mama? I hope you guys are seeing how fucked up this is. No, okay, so... She's hearing a voice in her head. I don't think that voice is God. I think that's a fourth density negative entity that sees an opening to manipulate. It is not up to a small child, the responsibility of whether a child, a parent passes away or not and saying, will you give me your mama? Yes, I answered. If you will take me as well. No, the voice replied, give me your mama without reserve and I will take you to heaven later. I can only answer yes when mass was over and I ran home. So... Now she's carrying the weight as a small child, manipulated by this voice in her head, thinking that she's the one that possibly unalived her mother. You guys get that? Like, as a child, like, you get that? Like, even as an adult, if she were to then go back and be like, no, my mother had tuberculosis, she was sick, it wasn't my fault. It doesn't matter if the adult logical mind can figure it out. The feelings and energy of the responsibility of that child is still within the DNA and the psyche. Does that make sense? It was her first great sacrifice and it caused her bitter grief and tears. But when her mother was unalived a few months later, it was Gemma who consoled the others. Gemma was only eight years old. Why should we cry? Mama has gone to heaven. So obviously this child doesn't understand the grief process, nor is she wanting her children or her siblings to actually grieve. 
And the fact that this blog or this website is actually supporting the fact that she was the one who sacrificed her mother. Why? Like, what was the point? This is so like, you guys, I am appalled. Like, this is, I'm all about freedom of speech. But in my commentary, just because you have freedom of speech does not mean that you are free from the consequences of that speech. And whoever wrote this should absolutely be ashamed of themselves for promoting these toxic, horrible ideas. Shortly after her mother's death, Gemma went to, was sent to the school of the Sisters of St. Zita and Luca. Under the direction and guidance of the good sisters, she acquired a great taste for prayer and a tender devotion to the passion of our Lord on which she began to meditate daily. Her love for the mother of God was always deep and intense, the more so as she had lost her earthly mother. If God has taken away my mother, she would often say, he has left me his own. Okay, how are people not seeing this child needs help? I know this was over 100 years ago, so obviously different awarenesses. But if a kid was saying this today, was so fixated on the fact that their mother had died to the point where they felt like they had sacrificed her, and they were talking about trying to find a replacement, child needs therapy. An eight-year-old cannot comprehend this. An eight-year-old cannot process the weight of this. I'm not blaming the eight-year-old. Please understand that. I'm blaming the, the adults around her who did not intervene to help her process this grief. She needed somebody to help her process what had happened. And I'm also blaming the person who wrote this wicked blog for continuing to spread these toxic beliefs and not saying, hey, man, in modern times, we can see where the problem is here. We can see how she turned out to suffer from what is probably borderline personality disorder and hysteronic personality disorder, right? We can see this now. Looking back, we see how this started because no adult stepped in to help her process her grief. And her frequent prayer was, holy virgin, make me a saint. Okay, so she wants to be special. We talked about that with hysteronics. She wants to be special. She needs that attention. Of course, her mother's died. She needs attention. She needs purpose for her life because her mother is gone. During this time, she often said the whole 15 decades of the rosary on her knees in the evening after her return from school. And she also began to use penances. What is an eight-year-old having to pay penance for? And rise at night to pray. However, the devout life is oftentimes a hard struggle. And the help she needed and desired most was yet denied her. Duh, she needed a freaking therapist. She needed an adult who had enough wherewithal to see that this child was suffering. And this child was trying to make sense of something that did not make sense to her. A child who obviously felt abandoned, but obviously was shamed into not expressing the grief of that abandonment. So therefore started to take Remember how I said borderlines will themselves? So we're seeing that here. She's using penance. She's punishing herself to feel something, to feel her grief, to act out that grief. This is so obvious. It's so freaking obvious. And again, whoever wrote this damn blog, you should be fucking ashamed of yourself. Instead of talking about how this girl was a victim of trauma, and what we can learn from her story so no other child experiences this, you're using it as a point of pride. God help your children if you actually have. Maybe we should get the, the government to actually DCF or whatever to actually check on your children. No child should be paying penance. No eight-year-old should be hurting themselves, harming themselves. Because they feel guilt or because they can't talk about losing their fucking mother. Whoever wrote this blog, you are heartless. You should not be around children. All right.
She had long expressed the wish to make her first communion. You are too young, the parish priest had told her. Give me Jesus, she would say to the confessor or the sisters, and you will see how good I shall be. I will not sin again. So she's bargaining. She's bargaining. No one's telling her, you actually have God. God's already there. She's trying to bargain for some sense of release from her own pain. I'm like shaking right now. This is so obvious. This is so fucked up. But the customs of the time was against communion at so early an age. Okay, so the communion at an early age, that was against custom. But paying penance? Hurting herself? Slapping herself? You got your priorities a little wrong here. And she was 10 years old before permission was finally granted and only granted by special exception. There is no alternative, the confessor declared, but to admit her to communion or see her die of grief. Okay, hysteronic right here. She's obviously acting out. She's very theatrical. She needs attention. As a child at 10 years old at this point, she needs attention. She needs love. She needs compassion. She needs someone to hug her and tell her that absolutely it sucks that her mother died. And absolutely it's not fair that her mother died. She needs somebody to allow her to be a 10-year-old little girl who needs a parent. We can only imagine the angelic fervor with which she received her Lord for the first time on the Feast of the Sacred Heart on June 17, 1887. I feel a fire burning here, she said to one of her fellow friends, afterwards pointing to her breast. Do you feel like that? She did not imagine that there was anything exceptional in her own experience. Her life afterwards was a constant growth in union with Jesus. Gemma is good for nothing, she would say. Gemma, but Gemma and Jesus can do all things. So that means that she ain't got no such a self. Because Gemma, honey, you were born with the spark of God inside of you. You're good for a lot of things. And I'm sorry, Gemma, that nobody told you that as a child. That nobody sat there and told you how proud they were of you. Of all the things you actually could do. I am sorry, Gemma, that no adult was there for you to help guide you and mold you and give you the support that you needed as a child to become a happy, functioning adult. Gemma, you were good for a lot of things. On your own. Gemma's school life was brought to an end by a painful injury. An injury to her foot. Painful illness, excuse me, an injury to her foot, which made, which she made light of, resulted in severe and painful infection, and she was forced to remain bedridden for some months. An operation was necessary, but she refused an anesthetic, and with eyes fixated on the crucifix, suffered the excruciating pain with little but a moan or two. So that's again that that need for physical pain. That's what happens with borderlines. They need. They create physical pain in order to express or alleviate whatever emotional pain that they're feeling. So the fact that she refused anesthetics, which I don't think that would happen today, I don't think they would let you do that, meant that she was seeking that pain because she wanted to release the pain she felt inside of herself. Restored to health, she now took her place in the home to do the duties that naturally fell upon the eldest daughter in a motherless family. During this time, she kept quite busy, for it was a large household. In the intervals, she busied herself with making altar linens and vestments for the church or clothing for the poor. However, her activities were not confined to the home. She would often gather the poor children of the neighborhood together for religious instructions. She frequently visited the sick in hospital, bring, bringing them little material comforts, but, as, but especially comforting them with the thoughts of God. Her charity to the poor and sick went almost to the point of extravagance. Every time she went out, she would ask her father for money to give in charity. And if sometimes he refused, she would coax permission to take bread or whatever she could lay her hands on at the moment. Her home duties and her pressing concern for others were in no sense an obstacle to growth for her interior life. Rather, the contrary. Her busy life of active charity 
drew its impressions from her life of prayer and union with God. When she was most occupied with external things, she seemed to those around her wholly absorbed in God. Her life was one continued prayer. She was disassociating. She was disassociating. Says a priest who knew her well, and her prayer book was the crucifix. The thought of suffering of Christ never left her. And it was in those days, as she tells us, she began to feel a growing desire to love Jesus crucified with all of her heart and together with the longing to help him in his suffering. She was especially drawn and devoted to the passion of our Lord. Oh, Jesus, she prayed, I wish to follow you, whatever it may be, whatever it cost me of suffering to follow you frequently. I wish to suffer for you. Again, she's confusing love with pain and she's disassociating. Grave illness. God was not long in answering her prayer, for it was this time when she was diagnosed with spinal tuberculosis or possibly spinal meningitis, which we spoke about earlier. She had felt symptoms for a while, but her pious repugnance to medical examination made her conceal it until she self found herself bedridden. Again, she wants to feel pain. Also, what we have, too, is attention. When you're sick and not feeling well, you get desired attention. Her pitiful condition and the patience and sweetness with which she suffered drew those who knew her to her bedside. One of these brought her the life and, and venerable, the life of venerable Gabrielle Pozzanetti, who was known for his sanctity and miracles, though not yet canonized at the time. Jenna at first took the little interest in the life, but having once invoked Brother Gabriel's name in a distressing temptation with an instant effect, she then read the book several times and thus developed a special devotion to him. Not long afterwards, he appeared to her amidst her grave illness, speaking words of consolation and encouragement, probably was a fourth density negative entity mimicking this dude. Miraculous cure. In February 1899, the doctors pronounced her case hopeless and she received the last sacraments. Her confessor since childhood, Monsieur Giovanni Golpi, auxiliary bishop of Luca and afterwards bishop of Arezio, visited her on February 19th and suggested she should make a, no a novena to St. Margaret Mary for her recovery. Twice she began the novena but forgot to continue it. When that followed, may be the best told in her own words. I'm like horrified by this, guys. Like, I'm horrified. On the 23rd of February, I began it for the third time, or rather had meant to begin it, begin it, for it was now within a few minutes of midnight when I heard the clink of rosary beads and felt a hand laid on my forehead. A voice said, Our Father, Hail Mary, and Gloria nine times in succession. I hardly answered I was so weak. Then the voice said, do you wish to be cur cured? Yes, you will be cured. Pray with faith to the sacred heart of Jesus. I will come every evening till the end of the novena and we shall pray together to the sacred heart. And what of the blessed Mary, uh, Margaret Mary, I asked. Repeat the Gloria three times in her honor now. It was the passionist St. Gabriel Possetti who had appeared and encouraged her. He came every evening and we recited the prayers together. The novena was to end on the first Friday of March. Early that morning, I received Holy Communion. Oh, what happy moments I passed with Jesus. He too asked me, do you wish to be cured? My emotion was so great that I could not speak, but in my heart, I answered, whatever your will, oh Jesus. The grace was granted. I was cured. I rose from bed. Those in the house were crying for joy. I too was pleased but not so much that I had been cured as that Jesus had chosen for me his child. For that morning before he left, he had said, My child, the grace you have received this morning will be followed by many others still greater. So I'm seeing a combination of things here. I'm seeing the possibility of a fourth density entity figure manipulating her. I'm also seeing her need to maybe exaggerate what happened in order to get attention or be special because she did not get enough attention or love in her childhood. Gemma was, Gemma's cure was complete and permanent. Her illness had lasted more than a year and had brought her to death's door. But afterwards, her health was perfectly normal. Her first thought after her recovery was one she had for long to hope for, that of entering convent. Circumstances up to this point had made it impossible to realize. 
but now her way seemed clear. Several religious communities in Luca would gladly have accepted her and even encouraged her hopes. But ecclesiastical authority was slow to believe in the permanence of her sudden cure from such a dangerous disease, and also her extraordinary mystical experiences were known to the local bishops. So her great sorrow, Gemma found the convent doors regretfully but firmly barred against her. She seemed like a handful. Meanwhile, her spiritual life continued to grow in intensity and fervor. Her union with God became more intimate, and her soul began to be visited with divine communions of the most extraordinary and exalted kind. She had been accustomed, even during her illness, to make the holy hour in honor of the agony of Jesus in Gethsemane. In gratitude for her recovery, she now promised the Sacred Heart of Jesus that she would recite this, the, recite the Holy Hour every Thursday night. I don't know what the Holy Hour is because I grew up Presbyterian. A promise she kept for the remainder of her life, it was during this Holy Hour that Jesus began to pour into her soul those marvelous and extraordinary graces which made her life of martyrdom of love. Martyrdom is the negative path. Martyrdom is Luciferian. Read the law of one. Do not be a martyr. Her love, her first experience of this Holy Thursday, she thus described in her spiritual director, I spent the whole hour praying and weeping for my sins, feeling weak I sat down. The sorrow continued, but after a little, I felt wrapped in recollection. Shortly after, I suddenly lost the use of my senses. I tried to get up and lock the door of my room. Where was I? I found myself in the presence of Jesus, crucified, blood flowing from his wounds. The sight filled me with pain. I lowered my eyes and made the sign of the cross. I felt a great presence of mind, but still intense sorrow for my sins. I had not the courage to look at Jesus. I bent down with my forehead to the ground and remained so for several hours. When I came to myself, the wounds of Jesus were so impressed on my mind that they never since left the vision filled Gemma with a new horror for sins and with an intense desire to suffer with jesus and become a victim for the salvation of souls so she wanted to be a victim she wanted oh my god this is so bad this is so bad the desire was to be gratified in a way she little expected one morning after holy communion she heard the voice of jesus say to her Courage, Gemma, I wait for you on Calvary, where you are going soon. No, no, guys, that's Lucifer. That's fucking Lucifer. If you hear that voice, that's Lucifer. The real Yahshua, the real God would never say that to you. Gemma receives the stigmata. The meaning of the words was soon made plain. A few days later, on Thursday, June 8th, the eve of the Feast of the Sacred Heart, when she began, as usual, to make the holy hour, she felt a piercing sorrow for her sins, such as she had never experienced because she was piercing herself with a needle. And a, a peculiarly vivid scene of suffering of Jesus, suddenly she was wrapped in ecstasy and found herself in the presence of her heavenly mother and her guardian angel. So when borderlines physically hurt themselves to relieve the, the, the physical pain is an expression of the emotional pain. They all claim to feel ecstasy once that physical pain happens because it releases the emotional pain. Let's understand that. Don't mistake this for a spiritual experience she's having when it's a mental disorder, which is also, I think, encouraged by demonic oppression. But nonetheless, please do not think if you are someone who believes in God, that this is an example of what happens when you are in alignment with God. This is not, this is absolutely out of alignment with God, in my opinion. The angel made her repent an act of contrition, and Mary comforted her with the assurance that her sins were forgiven and told her she was to receive a great grace through her love of Jesus. Then, they are Gemma's own words, she opened her mantle and covered me with it. At the same moment, Jesus appeared with his wounds open, but instead of blood, flames as it were a fire seemed to issue from them. In an instant, those flames touched my hand and feet and heart. I felt as if I were dying and should have fallen to the floor had not my mother supported me under her mantle. I remained in that 
position some hours. Then she kissed my forehead. The vision disappeared and I found myself on my knees alone. But I still felt intense pain on my hands, feet, and heart. I rose to go to bed, but I found that blood was flowing from the places where I had the pain. I covered them as well as I could and got into bed with the help of my guardian angel. Next morning, I found it difficult to go to Holy Communion. I put on a pair of gloves to hide my hands, but I could scarcely stand and felt every moment that I should die. The pains continued until 3, p- 3 p.m. on Friday, the piece of the, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Apart from her confession and distress at such a sinner being so favored, Gemma only, only, Gemma's only thought seemed to have been like that which occurred to her after her first communion when she felt a fire burning in her heart and also that it was a common experience with those whom Jesus had chosen for his own. She began to, began to make timid inquiries among her friends during the day but only succeeded in mystifying them without obtaining any information. So she's being theatrical. She's, she wants people to know she's special. For that attention. At least feeling that she must confine in someone as the blood continued to flow, she went to her aunt, holding up her hands, and said, with simplicity of a child, Aunt, see what Jesus has done for me. The good woman was struck dumb with amazement, but a little, but a, but as little understood the meaning of the strange phenomenon as Jam- Gemma herself. The phenomenon was pr- repeated regularly every Thursday evening, beginning at 11 p.m. and lasting until 3 p.m. in the afternoon of Friday. Gemma seemed to pass through all these phases of the passion and bore in her body all the marks of Christ's physical suffering, not only the wounds in her hands, feet, and side, but the punctures of the crown of thorns, the marks of the scourging, the wound of the soldier caused by the weight of the Christ, or the shoulder caused by the weight of the cross, all accompanied with more excruciating pain. Throughout those hours, she engaged in loving conversations and colloquies with Jesus in a low voice, often tenderly pleading for mercy of sinners and offering herself as a victim in expedition for their sins. This is like actually giving me a headache. Like, how are you guys responding to this? Like my, I'm actually like, want to shut this website down. This is like the least unholy thing I have ever read. And I feel so sorry for this girl. She is being used and abused by the people around her, by the church. I'm just, I'm, I'm appalled by this. For some time, Gemma kept extraordinary occurrences, a secret even from her confessor, partly through her extreme, extreme humility, girl had no humility, and partly through the difficulty of explaining them in the confessional. A few weeks after they began, however, a mission was given to her by the passionate's father and Luca, which Gemma attended. After the general communication of the last day of the mission, she heard an interior voice say, you shall be the daughter of my passion and a favorite daughter. One of these shall be a father to you. Go and make everything known to them. So more attention, more extravagance. I don't know if I can finish this, guys. I'm going to put this. I'm going to go to her final illness. Like, I am really getting a huge migraine from this. So um, I'm going to put this in the description box below because you. Uh, this is disgusting. So let's just skip down to final illness. You can read all the other stuff for yourself. At Pentecost 1902, she was suddenly stric- with, stricken with a mysterious illness, which lasted with one short interval for the remaining nine months of her life. She could not taste any food. Her body was torn with the most violent pains, and she was reduced to a skeleton. At first, she ma- managed to drag herself to the church for mass and holy communion with the help of her adopted mother and friend Cecilia, but this consolation soon had to be abandoned due to her t- deteriorating health. She probably got fucking sick because she was beating herself up all the time. Doctors were called in but disagreed with her diagnosis, for the most part confessed themselves baffled by the mysterious nature of her disease. The pains which racked her body without ceasing were, avagri- were aggravated by furious assaults of the devil on her body and her soul. No horrendous and content- so horrendous and continuous that she imagined herself possessed and begged to be. Yes, yeah, she was possessed. She had a m- mental disorder. Her heroic life, all of her virtues she had practiced, all the divine favors she had received were now represented to her as an a- accumulation of hypocrisy and deceit. 
And during all those months of suffering, no ray of divine consolation reached her heart. She continued to pray unceasingly, calling on Jesus and Mary to be with her in her hour of bitter derecolation. De 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 I can't even speak now, guys. My head hurts so bad. I feel like I'm going to throw up. And outwardly preserved a serene and unrefined calmness of her bodily pain. She never complained, but once she murmured, my Jesus, it is more than I can bear. But when the sisters in attendance on her reminded her that God's grace, it is possible to bear all things. She never used that words again. On the contrary, when the sister once asked her, if you had your choice, which would it be to go to heaven and cease to suffer or to remain here and suffer for the glory of God? Better to suffer, she said, than go to heaven when the pain is for Jesus and all his glory. One of the religious nursing sisters from the order of St. Camellias who cared for Gemma during her illness stated, we have cared for a good many sick people, but we have never seen anything like this. Holy death. One last, one last consolation remained to Jesus, and of this she was soon to be deprived. I can't, guys. I just can't. Let's skip down here. Gemma Galgani was beatified by Pope Pius XI on May 14th, 1933, and canonized by Pope Pius XII on Ascension Thursday, May 2nd, 1940. This is a shit show, y'all. Anyway, I think I made my point. This is not somebody, oops, this is not somebody that we need to be venerating. This is an example of a very sick girl who instead of getting treatment was used and abused by the church. Anyway, I'll find another female stigmatic for us to look at that might be more along the lines of Padre Pio and St. Francis. But nonetheless, there's an example of borderline personality disorder left untreated, my friends. All right, leave me your thoughts and your comments down in the comment section below.